Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us for this wonderful occasion. Boy, a MacArthur grant. There's not much, much cooler. And I, you know, I'm speaking like a student right now. There's nothing much cooler than that. Um, so thank you for, for, for joining us to, to celebrate this really amazing achievement, uh, mostly for Jake, but for all of us. I think we're all, we're all going to bask in, in his glory we have for the last couple of months. So uh, just a wonderful achievement by, by Dr. Jake Saul. And, and we're here all to, this evening uh, to hear from him and also from our, our alum, Rich Argood, um, and a discussion uh, about w what about Jake's scholarship and, you know, and, and what got him to this point of being a MacArthur Fellow, which is really a fascinating story and, and, and one that we all look forward to following for, for the next five years and thereafter. Uh, um, so Jake, I have to say, one, again, congratulations. Um, two, we, we just couldn't be more impressed and happy for you. But I have to say, we're also all jealous. Um, every, sing, every single one of us. Let's be, on, let's be honest here for a second. Everybody in this room is really jealous. Uh, but but, but that, 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 that envy is mostly positive in, in, in uh, our, our gratitude that you're one of our colleagues. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I want to get the, get the program started. And I was going back and forth on whether to share this quick story and whether or not it really set the right tone. But I've decided I'm going to go for it. So, um, so in, in addition to, to being, uh, having Jake as a wonderful colleague, and I am proud to be a member of the history of Department too. Uh, Jake and I happen to be neighbors, um, and uh, Jake and I both belong to the Neighborhood Swim Club, uh, and our families belong to the Neighborhood Swim Club, and, and I have to just briefly mention that not only is Jake a wonderful scholar and a wonderful writer um, and a wonderful teacher, but he is an amazing raconteur, as you're going to hear. Um, and I've seen that not only on campus, but up close from this, the shallow end of the pool of the University City Swim Club. Even at the University City Swim Club, Jake holds court with 10, 15, 20 people, some of whom are listening, some of whom I think are more interested in swimming. Um, but but, but, but more, more than a few of them are actually interested in listening. Um, and, and I think that really is a testament to, to his ability to, to, uh, be, to connect. Um, and you're going to see that in a minute. But before we get to Jake and Rich Argood, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the Dean of uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, Chris Lindemeyer. Thanks. And thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I have a little script because I'm going to introduce Rich Argood, and his accomplishments are so ex so many that there's no way I could remember it, even being a historian. This is the historian show today. So I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to campus for this exceptional event. We're here to honor Professor Jake Soule's stellar achievement of being named a MacArthur Fellow, Fellow, but we're also here using this occasion to celebrate the importance of research and scholarship as a key mission at the Rutgers University Camden campus. Professor Soul is one of many outstanding faculty that I have the pleasure to work with at Rutgers University Camden. The Sterling faculty and their students produce important and influential scholarship every day. They're the key to Rutgers University Camden's success as the research university in southern New Jersey. It is wonderful that this event has brought so many proud alumni back to campus. We also have visitors from off campus who, for some of you, this may be your first visit to campus and we welcome you. One of the alums that is here is Professor Richard Argood a 1965 graduate of the Camden College of Arts and Sciences, and he has generously agreed to serve as today's interviewer moderator. Professor Argood is currently the Charles R. Johnson Professor of Journalism at the University of North Dakota, but this is only his latest honor and an exceptionally distinguished career, as he describes it, a word guy. Before going to the University of North Dakota, Rich Argood earned the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing in 1985 while working at the Philadelphia Daily News from 1975 to 1995. Rich was the Daily News' highly regarded editorial page editor beginning in 1978. He's also a three-time winner of the Distinguished Writing Award from the American Society of Newspaper Editors and the 1994 recipient of the Scripps Howard Foundation's Walker Stone Award for Editorial Writing. Rich began his professional career as editor, reporter, and photographer for the Dix McGuire Mirror, a now defunct weekly that served military bases in southern New Jersey. He went on to become a reporter and Night City editor at the Burlington County Times and a stringer for United Press International, 
the New York World Telegram, and others. Rich was also the James A. Clendenin Professor of Journalism at the University of South Florida. And I can't resist sharing that he was the, a newspaper uh, participant and a, as a student reporter for the Rutgers Camden Gleaner. They're here. <laughs> Rich was inducted into the Rutgers University Hall of Distinguished Alumni in 1993 and is a member of the Dean's Council for the Rutgers Camden College of Arts and Sciences. Of course, these are only a few of his accomplishments. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Rich Argood, and we very much look forward to hearing this wonderful discussion. What would you like to know, Walter, and how can any of these people go about getting one. <laughs> the, the, the great, the, I'm proof that anyone can get a MacArthur. So I think everyone should go for it. And you know, um, uh, let's just put it this way. Um, I have not had a really good sleep since early September because it's like a whirlwind. And uh, it's, uh, or I use the, uh, the metaphor of a roller coaster ride that you know starts and it's amazing and it keeps going <laughs> and it keeps going and it keeps going and the phone keeps ringing and the emails keep coming and uh, and it's amazing and really intense <laughs> so it's a great experience and I'm looking forward to it slowing down a little bit and focusing on life but um, the best part of it and this is really true is that you know you get this phone call um, there's a, the famous MacArthur phone call and it's and it tr you know you truly actually get the phone call. And you're walking, and if you're me, you're grumbling, and you're thinking, God, you know, you know, how am I going to do my work? I can't keep going. This is life is just, you know, the sort of, you know, litany of normal complaints that any good researcher uh, or, or person from the Northeast might have. Right. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then you get this phone call, and you think, I'm not, I mean, who is this? What do they want? You know, but I answered it because I actually thought someone from Connecticut was calling me and I didn't know what the area code looked like. I was like, oh my God, it must be a phone call from Connecticut. So I picked up the phone and it was raining. And I was actually on my way to the library. And uh, you, know, you get the phone call and, it's, and you just absolutely don't believe it. You're like, okay, is this is this, you know, my best friend from college? You know? and, uh, and, uh, and then they're like, they tell you to sit down because they don't want you to have, obviously, a heart attack um, when you, you get the news. And then, and then they start, then, well, then you don't believe them, and they give you a number to call back. And, and I don't know how people, people used to do it before, because they know about the phones. And they said, Google the number. Because I was like, I just don't, I'm sorry, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And so I Googled the number, and I was like, wow. <laughs> and then I, you know, I pressed call. and. And I got the secretary, and then I got onto some speakerphone, and I could hear the snickering in the background. <laughs> I could hear people holding the laughter in, because you know I was like, "Is this for real?" And then they, then you get 45 minutes, where they give you. You're never going to talk to them again. Well, you know, you get to call them back again in three hours when you don't believe it again. <laughs> but that's it. <laughs> and um, and they give you for 45 minutes this your life story which is pretty terrifying because they've been watching and watching and watching. And, uh, and you know, you think, thank God, you know, I, you know, whatever, I haven't been busted or something like that or, you know, publicly arrested uh, uh, in the last 20 years. And so, um, and so, uh, 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 So you get, you get a buy on the early arrest? <laughs> <laughs> no, luckily, you know, no web. So I'm just joking about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, of this generation, you want, the, yeah, you want the genius grant, you can't get busted. You know? I don't know about that. Maybe they have an interesting policy towards it. You could look at genius winners and see who's been busted and who hasn't. It's an interesting, that's an interesting genius award sort of uh, research idea. But, um, but yeah, and so it's amazing. So these, they, they tell you what you've been doing for what I then concluded had been six years of them watching me. And, uh, and then, they, then they tell you what you're doing. And you're like, I am? That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, uh, uh, and, that's, and that's the kind of best part. You're like, no way. This is about my work. And I'm like, somebody cares. Uh, and, uh, 
and it's really intense. And then they say, now get ready. Get ready. You should try and get some rest. You're like, yeah, sure. And they're like, you can't tell anyone. You're like, <laughs> Did they talk anything about how they make these choices? The only other MacArthur Grant person I have ever known was Marion Williams, the great gospel singer. You don't sing gospel. No, absolutely. That's one uh, of the reasons I got it, yeah. Um, <laughs> but making the connections a little broad, I, did they say anything about how they, other than watching you? <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I did say, I did, I think, in a kind of like plaintive, I said, why, you know, why, you know? <laughs> and, it's and like said, Job. <laughs> no, no, because, because they're not going to give you, well, you know, I mean, I'm not, you know, obviously, they're not going to tell me this stuff and then expect me not to talk about it. Um, they said more than 120 letters or something like that. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of people. But they said it was very good that you published a lot. Because I said, well, you know, give me some hints here. You know, I'm interested, besides the fact you're interested in the topic and whatever, because I'm not going to believe that. But I'm just interested in the technical. And the one thing they gave away is they said, you published a whole bunch that really helped. Mm -hmm. And I was, like, I was like, OK, I'm glad because that's what we're supposed to be doing in a research university. Um, and, uh, and that's why you stay up late, that's why you work on weekends, that's why you get sick, that's why you fly to Europe, which sounds fun, except when you have to get up and go to a library, and they tell you that that entire collection's been closed down, and you have to threaten them and cajole them, it goes on afternoon, you get the material, and then you get pneumonia. So, you know, it's an intense business, you know, to publish a lot. People don't always get that, so. I love this book. I would advise you to get out of the library. The publisher is charging entirely too much for it. <laughs> but, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> but just send Jake a check for ten bucks and take it out of the library. Uh, we know. I, I, I'm fascinated with that whole research university thing because a lot of uh, a lot of people don't make the correct assumption that a place like this is really a research university where you generate MacArthur grants, where you have uh, undergraduates who win Pulitzer Prizes, where you have uh, a, a record. And personally, I think the Newark and Camden campuses are the ornaments of the record system. The other place is just a place that buses right around it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but, But I know you have you have some insights on a campus this size yeah. with this kind of uh, dedication to uh, educating real people and its right. role as a as a uh, as a research university. You want to elaborate? Yeah, before I, mean, I trip myself. Well, up? you know, first of all, I get. I mean, you know, when the crisis hit and it was big, I was like, you know, this is it. They're going to see that one of the one industries in this country that works really, really well is exported, universally recognized as the best in the world, et cetera, et cetera, is higher education, and they're going to really back us up. And obviously, I was totally wrong. And, <laughs> um, and, you know, we just kept getting hit, and then there were a series of insulting articles about professors not working, and I was just like, wow, I don't get it. I don't get that people don't understand it. And I did sort of think, you know, we don't make our case enough. And people don't actually realize what we do. And for example, I think even on this campus, um, you know, when we do a job search, People have to send a lot of work. They have to have written a lot. And then we all have to read it. Uh, uh, and then we do a job search. And then when someone comes on campus, they're like, look, you got to publish. And it's got to be good. You know what I mean? It's got to be. It's, and that doesn't mean that there's all these jokes about people publishing obscure works that nobody reads. Well, first of all, you know, did you read, has anyone, I mean, a few people in here, read the fine print on how your cell phone was made? Probably not, right? But it comes from technical research. There's historical research. These are all part of the same spirit and a lot of, in some ways, part of the same technique. Um, but remember, this is a college where, in order to get tenure and be a professor, you really have to come through. It's not that easy to do. We have the same standards that New Brunswick has. We do not have absolutely the same funding uh, by any means. Uh, and you know, I, have, I think people in the state don't get that. So we are doing a lot with, I think, a lot less. Um, and our standards are high. And you know, we've had painful committee meetings recently about this and about upholding the standard. Um, and it's not easy to do, to do the standard or even to uphold the standard. Um, it's an enormous amount of work. 
And what it means is, is that most of those professors who you see shuffling around uh, uh, have to go home and go to their, I would call it in some ways, their other job, right? Which is to research and write and talk and be involved in this giant world of knowledge. And it's extremely challenging. And we're just saying, there's no time off. <laughs> I mean, Saturday night is the night that you actually don't have too much to drink because after dinner, you're going to go try and work once everybody goes to sleep. So, you know. Um, and the other thing is, and this is the, the thing that's important is, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to come out and say it because I'm prejudiced. I'm for research universities. And my wife went to a fancy college. I didn't. I went to a big state research university. And I got to study with people who were major scholars. Now, you go to school for a whole bunch of reasons. And I can't even name all of them here uh, uh, in public. But um, uh, one reason that you'd want to go is to meet with these people who are discovering new knowledge. That's one of the neat things that we have on Earth. And you know this if you own a house, OK, or you own a car. Time is moving constantly. Things are decaying. But as they discovered in the Renaissance, you can also discover new stuff. In the Middle Ages, there was science. There was actually a, a massive they invented universities in the Middle Ages. But they didn't have a concept of new knowledge. No matter what one thinks about the discovery of America, because a lot of people died in the process, um, it was people who were curious. So curiosity and the idea that you would discover something new, it took hundreds of years for this to develop and to break its way out. People like Galileo went to prison over the concept of curiosity and data. Um, and you know Christopher Columbus, who celebrated for all, and I think totally misunderstood figure, Christopher Columbus was essentially a guy who went and he learned Latin, he learned Greek, he collected books, He's basically a professor. He did mathematics. He figured that, Pto that Ptolemy's map was wrong. We have that book, by the way, in Seville. You can see it on the web. Columbus saying, you know, these numbers are wrong. He's greedy. He wants more souls. But most of all, greed goes way back, OK? <laughs> the idea of, I don't know, getting converts, that goes back to, although the Romans didn't bother so much with that. Well, um, these people, none of them were monomaniacs. We were talking before about the, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale getting Casanova's papers. I mean, he was right. also a, this, a scholar. And right. Up until recently, if you, if you went to school, you learned a whole bunch of stuff. And you started with ancient languages. That was until the 1960s when America, and even Europe, except for Germany and Hungary and you know, one other country, decided that Latin was no longer important, which I'm saying that's not a good move, by the way since everything does come from Latin. But you know, in the 16th century, they actually come up with this thing called the Ars Apodemica, the art of travel, which was actually the basis of curiosity. And so this idea that in order to learn, you would have to move and travel and see new peoples and new things was also connected to reading new books, discovering things. And someone like Columbus is part of this. So this curiosity mixed with greed and whatever, but literally a technical belief that he could discover something new. This is the whole thing. This is the modern world. Whatever you think about it, at least for the moment, we've still got penicillin, so you can't totally diss it, OK? <laughs> you know? From, from Columbus to penicillin to everything, it comes from curiosity. And believe it or not, what happens is, is they start building, uh, about 100 years later, concepts of, the, of research universities after this. It was actually um, uh, Sir Francis B uh, Bacon who actually is the one who comes up with this vision. He calls it the House of Solomon. Solomon had all these, had this house where all the knowledge in the world was. And he comes up with this idea. And the medieval church university people were saying, we need to rebuild something and create institutes for, for creating and finding new knowledge. And that's where this comes from. It's a huge massive tradition in the West, and that's what we're involved with, and that's what students are coming for. It's not to hear what they've already heard. For that, you can go to a scholastic place from the 12th century. Good university, St. Thomas of Aquinas might have taught there, but curiosity and new knowledge. And that's why you want to study with people doing research, no matter how weird they are. Okay? <laughs> Well, I think the research adds something else, too, because 
there was a time uh, that this was my wait for a pizza book, the book I read while I'm waiting for pizza. And reading this book, my mind is making connections. It's making connection to modern day. It's making connection to bacon. It's making all the connections you make plus a few that I throw in. And I think that's a, a lot of what research does is stimulate you to think about things that you weren't thinking about before. And I, that's what your study of Colbert did for me. I mean, I, I, all of a sudden I'm thinking about Google and I'm thinking about uh, uh, government secrecy. I'm thinking about my own experience as a union official needing to have certain things take place in secret. Uh, so, you know, I would add that to your to your definition and, and expand on it to say that it, part of its role is to stimulate other people. Oh, you yeah, mean? absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, this book, this is a weird book because it ha I was writing another book. And I'm, listen, again, I can't stress travel enough um, because what happens when you travel is you see things through, like, this is, by the way, just technical humanist Ars Apodemica 101. You travel, you see things through other people's eyes. And suddenly you see things in a way you haven't seen them before, or you see connections that you never saw. Um, I, I researched this book in about five or six different countries. And what happened is I was writing another book. I was, I was studying this guy who was a political critic. He criticized uh, 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 an absolutist king, Louis XIV, when it was illegal to do so. And he found a way to do it. And I thought I was very clever in finding, showing how this guy could criticize a government or authority when you weren't allowed to do it. It's one of my favorite things to do, is to criticize authority. But <laughs> while I was doing that, while I was doing that, um, I, I, I found these police letters. And this is why doing research is so cool. Um, actually, I didn't find them. This weird French guy came up to me in the library, said, I see that you're reading that. Have you seen the police letters? Because I'm the only one that ever wrote anything about these obscure police letters. He gave me the piece of paper. I studied the police letters about this critic, you know, this guy. And, and these police letters were unbelievable because there's one letter from the chief of police. And I'm like, wow, the chief of police reads Latin and knows classical, the classical history of the church leading back to the early days of the church. I'm like, what kind of police chief is a classical scholar? I was like, well, the 17th century, the Renaissance, you got to know a lot, OK? Um, <laughs> but then there's another letter that goes to Jean-Baptiste Colbert's son. Colbert is the finance minister of the richest, most powerful king on earth. And I'm like, whoa, the son of the richest and powerful minister on earth is reading the police report, which is filled with classical references. And then, I, so I start digging. I'm like, this is really unbelievable. Where does the letter chain end? And this is like the Indiana Jones stuff. It doesn't look like Indiana Jones, but you also don't get dysentery doing it either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're in Paris, which is good, trust me. If you can afford it right now with this exchange rate, enjoy it. Um, but um, literally, it was like this kind of secret wall fell down, and I found this chamber of letters. Colbert was actually the guy reading the police reports. And I was like, whoa. So then what I did is I took the police letter, and I started connecting it to all the different Everyone who saw the letter, where the letter went, the archive, who controlled the archive. And I, I found myself in this vast chamber. I was like, this guy has a huge information network. No one's ever explained it. No one's ever really, actually, people did say it was there, but they, it was a long time ago. And they never studied it. And I was like, this is unbelievable. So when I was looking at the critic and thinking he was cool, I found the repressive guy at the other end. Mm. And I was like, you know what? He's a genius. I was like, this information system used to repress people, this thing is unbelievably transformational and visionary. This guy's an early information entrepreneur. Because a lot of these, do you think the people that run Google and Microsoft are fun people who share their information? <laughs> I think that Steve Jobs was like a nice guy who wanted to give things away? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Really intense, neurotic, controlling, harsh, visionary often repressive people. Um, and Colbert was one of these guys, and I recognized him from having spent some time also in Northern California. Um, and I was like, and so I said, you know what? There's a project here, too. And this is why research is important, but also to make the connections. 
I think when you come in from the outside, the French had stopped studying Colbert. He was the famous finance minister. End of story. So you come in with the outside eyes as a foreign, or partially foreign, I mean, person. Um, and so, you know, this is, and then you can come home and tell this story. Now, as a researcher, um, I mean, you said the book is a good read, but if people don't know about the book, they don't read it. Um, right now, I'm writing this story up for the New York Times. Once the MacArthur people came around, everyone now finds the book interesting, which I find is an odd coincidence. Um, <laughs> I don't know why it didn't happen before. Well, that's part of one of the, a conversation we had maybe a week ago about elites, you know, being recognized by elites. Uh, one of the funniest things I, I ever said to anybody, I was with a, a colleague who had worked for the, who had been editor of the New York Times, and somebody remarked that we both had Pulitzer Prizes, and I very snottily said, yes, and I never worked for the New York Times which really pissed him off. But at the same time, that's true of a lot of what we do. I mean, both in academia and everywhere else. You know, the certification from, from Harvard University, for example, or certification from the New York Times. Uh, places like this uh, do wonderful things, and they're not perceived as elite. Am I making sense? Yeah, no, I, I mean, look, Babylon look, 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 here's the truth of the world, and this is absolutely true. I published this book at Harvard. It would have gotten 10 times more press. That's just the way it works. Um, that's why people battle over these assistant professorships at these Ivy League schools, whether they stay or not, because everyone takes them seriously while they're there. This is the way of the world, however. So what you have to do is you have to try and find ways to get your voice heard. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to write a New York Times article before this, which I think did not hurt with the uh, 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 MacArthur. Think, think about the New York Times, though. What did they get, 5,000 proposals for op-eds a day or more? Um, because I'm now working with one of the guys on the op-ed team, and I'll be honest, he's so smart. Now that he's found my book, he understands it. He understands what's cool about it. He's a brilliant guy. The problem is, is how do you go out and get, <laughs> obviously, another sign of my great personal modesty. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Whatever. This is an academic. Academics have to have egos. Why else would they do it? You know what I mean? So you got you got to give us a break for the old ego, because in the dead of the night, it it leaves you. And you'd think, you know, <laughs> trust me. That's why, you, that's why you write these books. Anyway, but the point is you've got to, listen, if you think what you're doing is important, then you've got to go make yourself heard. I truly believe that. Some of the stuff can't be understood by a general public. It's really technical. But some of it can. And that's why you have to work on being a good writer. And that's why you've got to also, and that's right, people aren't going to listen to you if you're not coming from the fanciest thing. So what you have to do, it's like being a politician. You've got to go out and you've got to give papers over and over. You've got to travel. It's like doing like the Borscht circuit. I mean, before <laughs> I got this thing, I was, I was in Buffalo this winter giving the first paper for my new book. I had like seven people in the audience. It's like a blizzard. And people were va vaguely hostile about the project. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, God, you know, you know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm waiting for vaudeville here, you know? Um, and <laughs> essentially, then I worked it, then I worked it, then I worked it, and by the end, um, even though I had the intestinal flu, four weeks ago, I presented the same project in Berkeley to a room full of people, and it was great, and it was a really intense thing, because they knew a lot, and it was a hard and you know, wonderful meeting, and it went really well, but I was out making my case. You gotta do it, you gotta hit the pavement, you gotta do the circuits. It's not that easy to do. Now with the MacArthur grant, that's not an issue for me. But there are other ways. And one way is to publish, 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 and work on your writing. I like what you said about the challenge, though. I, I, my writing was never challenged when I was a journalist. When I was presenting papers, it was challenged by people who knew more than I did. Yeah. And that, that really does focus your attention. I mean, I did just finished a, a presentation on uh, something around Alice Roosevelt. 
not realizing that one of the professors in the room was probably the greatest expert on Alice Long Roosevelt Longworth who ever lived. And believe me, it tended to focus my mind. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people think that the introduction or the acknowledgments are obnoxious and psychophantic because <laughs> I name a lot of people um, in them. But that's because I do have a trade secret. And that is, is that um, I don't care what people say about me in private. <laughs> so I give my manuscript. I, and now this is the problem, though, is when you get more well-known, people are less willing to help you with your work. I gave this manuscript to 25 people, and a lot of people savaged it. And I remember one night when someone, we were talking earlier about Canadians, this Canadian guy, particularly mean about his comments. And I was like, I'm going to You found a mean Canadian? Yeah, definitely. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> Underneath that sort of dour, you know, <laughs> trust me, you know. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, so, and I remember that night, I was like, you know, that wasn't fair. This is mean, mean, mean. And someone wrote me an email and said, but read through the meanness, he's right. <laughs> and I was like, ugh. And the next morning I slept on it. I was like, yeah, 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 he was right. You put it in. It doesn't matter what happens behind the scenes. This is actually, I learned this trick from my dad. It was just like, get as many of the best readers as you can, the toughest, the best readers, because it's the final product that matters. That's why it takes a long time, too, because you need these readers to come back to you. And that's why you also present. You go, you give as many talks as you can, and you take the hits because everyone will forget those, except maybe the Canadian guy. Because um, I also I think I wrote him a mean letter. And maybe you. you know. Yeah, I'm not going to forget that. But at the end of the day, I'll buy him a drink. You know, I'll buy him a drink, begrudgingly. Um, but you know, he took the time to read it and do the work. That's another trick. Hey, to my students, there's, see? You, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you the papers back. They're going to be rough and truthful. So you, you know, you more or less do what I say, and you'll get there. Am I right? Kind of, yeah. You don't have a choice but to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. You know, one other thing, I mean, I went to school in France. In France, there's none of this, like, thanks for trying stuff. <laughs> they, I had a teacher, a medieval history teacher, who was, was an expert on the year 1000. And he was, he was, he was, he was a, a Stalinist. I didn't know that. Well, back then, communism existed, and I was the half-American guy in his class. He was a really nice guy. You know, that's another story. He was a really good, he was a good teacher, a good historian, and he knew Brezhnev. So anyway, but what he would do, which was unbelievable, and I still have dreams about this, is the, the French universities, the, they did something under the president, Francois Mitterrand, that everybody could go. But not everybody could get degrees, so they had to clear the room out. But they also, the French, and particularly the Germans, and this is one reason their economy might be doing better, is they do a lot of technical professional training. So when someone like replaces your dryer, they've been trained as an engineer to do that. And so when they replace your dryer, it's a meaningful act. Um, <laughs> but what happens is, is they, the, the guy would call everybody up in front of the class. It was almost this big. And he would tell each person, he would critique their paper in public. And it was painful. But what happened was, first there was, you were inspired never to do a bad job, okay? But I do that anyway, right? See, I do the French thing. I say I'm not gonna do it, and then I just do it. Because it works. Even though it's horrific, m probably illegal, um, <laughs> it, it works, you know? You come up, you're in front of the crowd, and you're just like, here's how your paper worked, here's how it doesn't. Now, what the French person would then go on and do is tell you what profession you should then go into. <laughs> and for years, I had a dream that I was in this amphitheater, and they called me down, and they said, Mr. Sol, you should be a, a carpenter. And I'm like, my, <laughs> my grandfather was a carpenter. I'm the worst carpenter in the world. And I said, but I'm the worst carpenter in the world. And then I'd wake up. Uh. So I think I had it again, actually, like a few yeah. weeks ago. I'd gotten rid of it, and now it's back. Anyway. Um, Speaking of skilled trades, well, would you discuss momentarily the odd little downside of the MacArthur that you told me about? Your plumber? What, not sleep? Oh, my plumber. Oh, yeah. Now is revenge time. My plumber's not plumbing. He was like, you're a snob. I heard you on the radio. You think you're too good now. I, I think he came over the night I got the MacArthur. Of course, that night, like tonight, my wife was working late. And I was with, well, I'm not with the kids tonight. She's working late and taking care of the kids. But I was with the kids the night of the MacArthur. And I was getting hundreds of phone calls, crazy emails, and all sorts of other stuff. 
And he knocked on my door, I think, to congratulate me. And I was like, thanks, I'm trying to put the kids to bed. And he took this as some kind of slight because I'm a MacArthur winner, and now I don't have the plumber anymore. <laughs> like, anybody has a really honest, good plumber, works for 25 bucks an hour, give me their number, okay? And also knows the houses in West Philly. Very important, you have to know these houses. Yeah, this has been a very stressed out. This, this has made me nuts, because I was just in, I was in Switzerland studying something, and our plumbing broke, and he told my wife to go to hell. It was unbelievable. Anyway, that, that's the downside, in every sense of the word, of the plumbing problem, of the MacArthur. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, he asked me. I mean, you know, this is the... The other thing is you don't get any sleep, you know? You don't get efforts all the time, all the time, all the time. But that's fine. That's well, fine. I want all these envious people to know there's a downside. You could lose your plumber. Well, it's super stressful. When I, when I, almost, I almost passed out before the paper in Berkeley because I saw people going, yeah, now we'll see. Now we'll see if he's any good. <laughs> or I heard people saying, you know, like, him? Because, of course, what do you think? I mean, I used to read the MacArthur thing and go, oh, my God. They couldn't have made a worse choice. I mean, who, this, play, this is not even a legitimate outfit, the MacArthur Foundation. Now, obviously, I think that they're great. <laughs> so, you know, um, so, yeah, there's nothing that focuses a, uh, a, a journalist's uh, uh, fondness for the Pulitzer Prize like winning one. That's right. Hey, there you go. It's pretty good, huh? Because we all make fun of it until it you know, comes along and then you say, well, well, shoot, they must know something. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. The Pulitzer Prize is great taste. Not all the time. No, but, no, yeah. no, not, not before. Right. Not before. You know, just <laughs> as the MacArthur grant had flaws oh, before they, they some flaws. There are some came, good people, obviously. <laughs> Travesties as well. But we can forget about that. Yeah, I, I'm struck in this book by uh, the almost eerie exactness of the similarities to today, to today's purportedly unique information culture yeah. and, the use, and the uses. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, t the Twitter revolutions. Sure. And I'm, I, you know, even then, even before I read this, I'm thinking, well, Twitter, that would be a good tool for repression as well. Oh, yeah. So okay. would you elaborate yeah, a little yeah. bit on, the, on those well, parallels? Well, first of all, this is, an, I mean, this is what I'm writing up for the Times. This is an amazing thing, is that starting in the early 1400s, there were these people who were usually ambassadors, um, but they were all scholars as well. You had to be a scholar, because the Vatican wanted their letters written in the old form of Roman Latin, not medieval Latin. So you had to be a, a true Latin scholar just to be a diplomat or a letter writer for the Vatican. All things come from Rome. And so, um, what happened is these were the first humanists. And humanism te technically means Latin teacher. Um, humanisti were the humanists. That word technically in the 1400s just meant Latin teacher. It meant that you could take a text, not only write it correctly, but you could also see if all the archival texts were real or fake because, because you could see if there were uh, Germanisms or things that weren't from the time in, uh, 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 in the text. Um, but essentially what happens is these guys start traveling around Europe, and they start corresponding, and they start sharing books. And by the time we get to the 1500s, they start calling themselves the Republic of Letters, because after you know, 1540, the church breaks apart, and you've got Christendom breaking apart, you've got repression. But the scholars and the ambassadors and the learned churchmen and the scientists and the merchants and the Jews and everybody, they're still uh, and the list goes on, and the, the, the Arab traders and the, 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 the guides from the New World, everyone circulating information, and what they called themselves was a republic of letters. Why a republic? Because it was free, in the sense that it didn't matter where you were from, you had to have a certain status, but you could communicate. If you were a Protestant, if you were a Jew, or you were a Catholic, if you were adding something towards knowledge, by the way, this is where the idea of the, the, the university comes from, too, and the academy. So there was this republic of letters where people communicated freely all around Europe and the expanding worlds of Europe and other worlds, and even in Turkey and all these other places. Um, and so what happened was, was this was an incredible resource. Uh, modern medicine gets created by this thing. Modern science happens. Uh, 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 the discoveries geography, technology, to the point where they start creating journals.
to report their findings. And a lot of these journals are illegal because this is free thought. A lot of it's not sanctioned by any church. The journals get clandestinely circulated. But what happens is, is a number of people say, wow. And that's what this guy does, Colbert does. He said, this free information system is great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it over. I'm going to shut it. And I'm going to use it for myself. And he's very, very good at doing it. That's why he's a visionary, because he was the guy who saw this several hundred year old free information network, which had a search engine capacity. You would write a letter to one of the central figures. They usually were librarians or people who had the great collections. You'd ask a question, a reference question. And the letters would go out. People would head into their archives. And then answers would come. And discussions would happen. Uh, chats, you might call them. Um, and we have a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, I mean, a lot of people were trying to map it, although I'm not sure if that necessarily matters. We know it was there. We know the center point. What he did is he figures out, and some of the people in the church figure this out too, because it was really the center in many ways of the Republic of Letters, was that they were going to go to the servers, which were libraries and archives, and they were going to take them over. And that's what they did. Um, the church was run by a family called the Barbarini family. And the Barbarini family, they were rich, but they were something else. Is the older brother was the pope, and the younger brother was a librarian. And they create the great, the great center of what is the Vatican collection, which is still the greatest library in the world, um, the Barberini collection. They don't just create it to be for prestige and for knowledge. They create it because they need to fight Protestants and fight people within the church, and this is going to be their tool. He figures this out, too. This is when the information arms race begins, and it has not ever stopped. But Colbert, being a merchant, knew things that the scholars didn't know. And, and this is a crazy story. In the French Revolution, the police files were in the Bastille. I don't know if you know, but in the French Revolution, it kind of starts when they storm the Bastille. Okay? Uh, they, they, they kill the governor, they put his head on a, sp a spike, and they throw all the police papers in the street. Across the street from the Bastille, uh, at the edge of the Marais in Paris, was the Russian embassy. And the Russian ambassador is watching this going, oh no, you know, this is no good. <laughs> and he sees the police papers go in the street. He grabs some of them. And he sends them back to St. Petersburg. But on the way, they have to go through Germany. Some of them fell off the back of the bus, as things often do. Something always falls off the they truck. Always falls <laughs> the back of the bus. Um, a huge, and we don't have a lot of Colbert's police papers. But about, what, 29 of them fall off the back of the bus, end up in a German collection. Somebody goes broke in the early 19th century. They sell it to the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and they're there now. And so the stack of Colbert's police letters are there. And what, I, what is clear is that they were folded in this very meticulous way. You know, he, you know, the reason, actually, this isn't a good jacket. A good jacket should unbutton, because an original jacket used to be folded up like this. Um, and in the old days, people kept all their correspondence in their sleeves. And so someone like Colbert had his sleeves filled with the things that would go out to his couriers all day and all the time. That's also a merchant technique, because you have to know what's happening in the port down in your office. If you're in Amsterdam, you want to know what comes off the boat, what the prices are, what boats don't come back. And there's these courier systems that merchants have. They have them all across Europe. The bankers have it for exchange rates. and so. I found this there, and I was like, wow, you know, this guy is able to control this network because he already understands how information networks work. It's, n it's not just scholars, it's also merchants. But so what we're living now, what we think is incredibly original, uh, has happened before in many different ways. You just didn't have code writers back then. They make all the money now. But can they think? Not always. Yeah, I've always I've been fascinated by what you were talking about. You know, the age of popes and anti-popes and Protestants and all that sort of thing. All this stuff that starts off based on the church suddenly moves to where, like Italian city-states, it's almost irrelevant who the pope is after a while with that kind of uh, merchant connection. It matters, but it, it doesn't matter in the way it would have if the church had managed to maintain a monopoly on information. Oh, the, chur the, church, 
the church only goes, the, the church is really important, which is why the Medici jump ship and, and take it over, okay? The, the banking is hard. Running the church is dangerous, but it's a better deal than actually being a banker. Even though Cosimo de' Medici was the richest man in Europe, Lorenzo de' Medici wasn't. But then Giulio and the others who become popes, that's real money, okay? Real money. You can throw real parties with that kind of cash. And the Medici papacy, you can also get the best fresco painters. You can get the best writers, the best musicians. Stuff them all in the Vatican, and it looks like Babylon, you know? Um, or at least that's what Luther said. Um, um, the church is absolutely essential for one other specific reason. As I always say to the kids in my class, what do they call the pope? He's the Pontifus Maximus. He's the emperor of the Roman Empire. That's why he has a senate. That's why he has governors. That's how it was set up. The Roman Empire never went away. That's what's so cool about it. Um, and once again, it's, I mean, the church might not be collapsing, but I was in Rome the night Berlusconi fell. I mean, nothing ever changes, you know, in Italy. Um, but this thing, this Roman Empire, is such a massive structure in the history of the West um, that it truly hasn't gone away. Um, and that's what the Medici obviously knew, and the Medici were trying to rebuild Rome, and when that got tough in Florence, they took the papacy over, and that's when people like the Barberini, all these were merchant families, okay? But being a merchant is really, 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 really hard. Uh, one of the fascinating, I was just in Florence, and I got them to let me have Cosimo de' Medici's account books, which are really unbelievable. Cosimo de' Medici kept double entry account books, um, and he managed the bank. He managed everything about it. But he had three sons, and he trained one to do accounting, and the others he trained because he knew that they would rule Florence. And his grandson, Lorenzo, the Magnificent, by the way, the word magnificent is actually a, a term from uh, accounting. It's, a, it's the head of a, a, a branch. A branch chief is called the magnificent so-and-so. Um, his son Lorenzo never learns it. And so the Medici Bank goes belly up in the, uh, 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 in the, 14, in the 1480s and 90s because Lorenzo's not actually doing any auditing. And so when he hears the news that he's lost all his money, he raids the accounts of the city Okay, I was just in Florence saying, he's not so magnificent. And they were furious because he's the big hero. I was like, he's not magnificent at all. He was a good art patron, but he trashed the city and he moved it all to Rome. Once he cleans out Florence, which will never be a leading city again, it will be a very, very important city. It won't be a leading city. Lorenzo sends the family to Rome where the money is. That money is tax money, comes from peasants. And we all know the best way to get rich is to get money from peasants, okay? Things have not changed. Who pays taxes? The peasants pay taxes. Nobody else does. So, um, so anyway, it's a fascinating thing. One of the things, once again, we've forgotten, if you want to stand, understand these information systems, these political systems, you gotta go back to Rome. If you wanna go back to Rome, I recommend learning Latin. Everybody soak that one in. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the opportunity that MacArthur gives you for research. I mean, we were talking about how difficult it is to get funding uh, for yeah, research. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I mean, and I'll say this. This is, this right before this happened, um, a wonderful institution in Philadelphia, founded by Benjamin Franklin, the American Philosophical Society, which, by the way, is a basis for the, the research university. And by the way, where is the American Philosophical Building's original building? Does anyone remember? No? If you're facing Independence Hall from Chestnut Street, it's the building on your left. When people built governments and built states, they would put a science academy or a library. Where's the Library of Congress? It's across the street from the, um, from, uh, 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 the Congress. Remember, where, where did the uh, uh, Supreme Court used to be? It used to be in a basement. It was only in the 1930s they brought them up, you know. And the effect has been, it's been very- It was very part of Roosevelt's deal, wasn't it? Yeah, we'll let you a, out of the basement if you- It's been a mixed effect, <laughs> it's been a mixed effect. But the point is, is that the, they built the Library of Congress before they built the Supreme Court. Think about this. Um, uh, Franklin uh, builds the American Philosophical Society 
This is part of building the United States of America, writing a constitution. You build a research institute next to it. This is how important this stuff is. Um, and they were kind enough to give me a prize, which was actually for me the greatest honor that I actually ever got, because it was the first one and it meant a lot to me. Um, and then they said, you're in line for one of our wonderful long sabbatical fellowships. And so as funding started drying up recently, I wrote and I said, hey, um, should I apply for one of these? And they're like, oh, we're so sorry. That fellowship's disappeared. We lost the endowment. I was like, what? I was like, that was one of three major sabbatical fellowships in the humanities. Three. Down. All right? Um, and I was just like, oh, my God. You know, it's really, really hard to get the money to do serious research. Um, and especially if you have to do research overseas, um, you know, as we all know the strength of the dollar. Um, uh, it's really, really hard to do. So obviously, someone like me right now is in a very enviable position from the st stance of research. I can, ha I can be incredibly ambitious. By the way, I'm writing this book about libraries and why they're so essential. I gave up on it. I just didn't have the cash. It's like, I can't do a good job. I'm not going to do it if I can't do a good job. I just won't do it. I'll write a couple articles. I will write that book again now. And this accounting uh, uh, project, yeah. I was giving a paper in, in Switzerland, which is a fascinating, essential place for actually understanding world history as well. Believe it or not, it is. Um, and I buzzed down for 48 hours to Florence to see these account books. I put it on my credit card because I knew I'd be able to pay the credit cards back someday. <laughs> not there yet. But the point is, but the point is, is that, yeah, I can do that now. I would never have, I got to hold Cosmos books and see them, and I understood a lot from doing that. This is because of the MacArthur. It's already begun. So yeah, I'm a lucky guy. But look, if you want people in this university to keep going uh, and keep doing research, by the way, find me a functioning research university that hasn't produced wealth, not just for its community, but for its larger community. Find it for me. I mean, I want to know. I want to know if there's one that hasn't produced wealth. The best investment you can possibly make with your tax dollars and with major gifts is to a research university. Um, but the thing is, is people like to build buildings. They like to build this. They like to put their names on stuff. That's great. You know, I actually don't want my name on stuff because I don't want people chasing me down. But one of the, one of the things to do is give money for research. I, I, I'm sometimes shocked that people forget that. I do think we have to make our case more that we need the money for the research so that our students are interacting with people who are functioning at the highest level who know what's going on and, and who are not working with people under stress, but who are you know, really involved and engaged and don't have to totally worry about that. Um, even the best universities, the richest ones, often leave their researchers without enough uh, money. The sciences and medical research, that's less of a problem. We're, we're actually part of the same thing. So I think people have to realize that. Um, and we all have to work on that and change the way we think about how we're going to do the absolute best job we can do. I think we also have to forget the cheap shots. Does anybody remember the Golden Fleece Awards? Senator Proxmire's uh, hobby horse. He would pick out some particularly absurd example of academic research and, and give it a, what he called a Golden Fleece Award on the theory that the taxpayers had been fleeced. Yeah, too easy, uh, easy uh, shot. And, uh, well, you could pick out anything. You know, you could look around and, uh, on any subject whatsoever and find out some, something absurd. I think we have to change that dynamic and make clear what academic research does yeah. in a positive sense rather than allow ourselves to be pot-shotted like that. Um, yeah, you know, and I mean, I'm going to say this also. It really helps when your, your governors and other people have gone to the university. I mean. Uh, I went to the University of Iowa where my dad's a researcher and they have uh, a Tea Party supported governor who has raised uh, uh, funding by between 3 and 7 percent. The number's kind of wobbly, but they've been raising funding. Why? Because Governor Terry Branstad went to Iowa, likes the place, knows it's important, and also, even though Iowa's riding high on corn right now, again, words you never get to say, riding high on corn. But he is, because there's not enough of it in the world, because some people no. think you should make gasoline out of it. But trust me, it's, it's all, don't feed it to pigs. But, but you can eat it. You can eat it. Um, but 
you know, there's not a lot in Iowa, and so they're worried that the university will lose its oomph. They also say, look, we're already getting a technology belt around the, this university due, due to various forms of research. And why do people come to Iowa City? Because of the writer's workshop. Um, in the old days, they went because of their history department. It was a famous history department. Um, you know, and it was world known for that. It was known for its cinema studies. Um, one day, I came to an elevator and Godard got out of it. I was like, what the hell is Godard doing in the city? <laughs> I mean, what, I'm, I thought it was hallucinating because he's an undergraduate that was possible. And, um, and um, but the point is, is that, is that that's, that was a really interesting example to me of Branstead because if you look at his politics, he's not the kind of guy who's going to love this liberal, wacky university, but he went there and he understood it and, and, and a lot of the business guys did too and so they're really supporting that university. I think citizens have taken their universities for granted. They expect them to be there. Uh, they expect the in-state tuition to be feasible. <laughs> I mean, in these days, I mean, it's hard. Um, but boy, uh, they always, they, we've always been around, right? But it's not easy, so. Well, you I, know, I, I don't think you can overestimate either the, the uh, cash reward of what was it, the New York Times yesterday or the day before had a list of the most prosperous areas of the United States? The Research Triangle of North Carolina, you know, I mean, places with heavy presence of research universities. Right. It's the only parallel they have. Right. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's a very, that's why I think we're in a strange political moment. I'm stunned that literally the politicians and the business leaders are not literally embracing the universities now and saying, look, America isn't going down the tubes. We're having a lot of problems, but we're still leading in these major ways. And by the way, the research university, it's very hard to replicate for several reasons. First, they're built up from the ground slowly, just like these hiring practices I was talking about. It takes a long time to build departments, to build you know, these traditions to build uh, uh, standards. Um, and there's something else you need. You need political liberty. It's not easy to be a professor if you're told, you know, what to say. And it's going to be hard to compete with American universities if we can still be free and be a big pain and, you know, do what professors do, which is complain, criticize, say things they're not supposed to say. When you think that's bad, it's actually kind of what we're supposed to be doing. Actually, it's what we're supposed to be doing. But then you've got to make it into good research. You can't just complain. You have to complain <laughs> and produce. That's a journalist, but, uh, just complaining. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if any of you all would like to join the conversation, uh, we have two microphones set up. I say that in the hopes that someone will. Well, until they crack. <laughs> Yeah, hey, come on. Hi, Lauren. So I have a very serious to understand this guy's question. world, okay? And what happened was, is I said the way to do this, I got, I've, I've got to read all the books that this person read, and I was like, well, it turns out this person was reading Italian books, Latin books, mostly because I mean, again, this was in the world of the church and in a very Latin world, Spanish, Portuguese. I was like, I'm going to need these languages. And, but in particular, I'm going to need a deep understanding of Italian if I'm really going to understand anything at this point. Plus, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's great. And to be able to speak, speak and understand Italian makes life much better. Just trust me. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, I went out and, I, uh, and that was something I got to do because I got another grant. And I got to pay for some of that out of that grant. But of course, you can't really learn a language sitting in a room with someone well. I learned it because I got to go to Italy for six months when I was a, a, a visiting professor. And I learned, it, I learned it with my friends in Italy, actually, mostly in this market that I liked, with this giant, giant pig that would come in from the mountains, this giant, uh, huge, huge porchetta that would come down. And I became friends with the guy who made it because, obviously, he wanted to do that. And he sold the fried skin of the pig. Anyway, but so yes. Yes. <laughs> and it's absolutely essential. You, and you've got to keep learning, too. It's also good for the brain. Learn, you should always keep trying to learn languages. You should never expect that there's any hermetic system. 
in anything. If you're in one field, listen, I was, I was, I was talk, talking to, uh, I was talking to a musician in California uh, uh, this weekend, and he said one of the ways he could undersee things in music when he was producing, doing big music production, when he could see the good parts in certain parts of music, is because he had studied literature, great, the greats, the classics, formally. And he really had a sense of often when things really clicked. Because by understanding Tolstoy, he could understand jazz. And so he was producing jazz records. And he said, Tolstoy really helped me out. I was like, good story, man. I was like, can I use that? I'm using it right now. Um, so. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about your um, talk is the role of serendipity in um, getting where you're at and it, sort of, you know, whatever the prepared mind, <laughs> luck, you know, you have to be prepared in order to take advantage of serendipity. And so I'm thinking of that guy who said, have you seen the police letters? <laughs> Do you know where that guy is? Did you take his phone number? Are you going to take him out to dinner the next time you got to Paris? So talk a little bit about serendipity in, in terms of taking advantage of it when it shows its head. And, and that guy, I hope you still yeah, know no, where we're, he is. We're, we're, no, actually, yeah, no, we're in con I, I owe him a drink, too. I owe everybody a drink. That's the problem. By the time I bought all the drinks, there'll be no more MacArthur Award left. Um, um, yeah, no, you have to be out there. You have to be curious. You have to be dealing with people. He was not a big guy in France. He was one of these strange people that inhabit libraries. And so, yeah, there's serendipity and there's there is luck. There's no question about it. But you have more luck the more you travel and the more people you interact with. Absolutely. So, and you know, the fact is, and the more places that you go, I cannot stress the importance of traveling and dealing with people from other cultures. Uh, it's, in America, we, we bring people in. It's also very good to go out. And that's another way. That's the way you find stuff, is you travel. You can't do it sitting in a chair. You won't be able to do it from the web, even if stuff is digitized. That's, you've got to go. By the way, Cosimo de' Medici's account books on the web, you can't understand them. You've got to hold them in your hand. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I tried. You know, Howard over here. Uh, Jake, I, I had a serious question for you, but I get up here and I want to ask you a question that more personal because I hadn't seen you from the back of the room, but where do you get those socks? <laughs> uh, from Marks and Spencer's, where I get all my undergarments. Great. And I always have. Great. That's, That's one of the advantages of going to Cambridge University in England is that you learn that everybody, some of the greatest people on earth, buy their undergarments at Marks and Spencer's. And I hope that I'm going to get a kickback from this. But they, the British, still make the best undergarments in the world. I don't think they make them there anymore. But sometimes I'll accept a speaking engagement in England so that I may buy my undergarments <laughs> at Marks and Spencer's. They have just reopened in Paris. And I noted that. And I said, now I don't have to go to England anymore. <laughs> In that hey, same you hear spirit, the serendipity I, here. You, you. Yeah. <laughs> in that same spirit, I want to ask you about um, travel. Um, you talked about travel being uh, a way of seeing things from other people's eyes and getting uh, distance from our day-to-day -day life. And uh, I think it was David Lowenthal who had a, a book that called "The Past: A Foreign Country." And what I'm hearing you say in one, way, one direction is that we can learn from the past. You're, you're making some interesting analogies with something that seems quite foreign to most of us who aren't versed in the period you're talking about. So can you reverse it a little bit? We're, we're talking about, as you teach and you write, you're really giving us time travel. You're, you're taking us into a world that's totally um, unknown to us and, and obscure in many ways, and you're trying to make, make it familiar enough that we can make the connection just read The Swerve, and I see that Stephen Greenblatt is in many ways doing a similar kind of thing to, uh, to talk about a world that I see some overlap with the things you've talked about. Can you reflect a little bit on that whole question of how a foreign country can also right. illuminate our yeah. own lives? Oh, yeah. Well, the foreign country is the world of the dead, where I spend most of my time. Um, modern historians get to hang out with live people. I think they're more <laughs> troublesome, because you have to do live interviewing, and that's really complicated. But yeah, most historians deal with dead people. Um, people don't always say that. But one of the interesting things is, especially if you study a foreign country, is not only do you have to learn that country, but you have to learn that country of the dead. One of the things that I also understood was the best way to understand the dead world of a foreign country is also to 
understand the live world. So I usually live and learn the language and the cultures of the places that I study. It just so happens they're places like France and Italy. Um, you know, <clears throat> that's by personal interest and also because they're really nice. Although I don't know if Italy is still around. I haven't checked my, my uh, if, if it's just disappeared into the Mediterranean Ocean. But, um, but the other thing, this is one reason I had, I mean, I grew up partially in France. And I went to school for years and years in France. And I spent a lot of that time in the National Library. What I gained, and when they knocked the National Library, they didn't knock it down. They left the room empty, which really upset me. They kept one room, the manuscripts room, that have all the Colbert papers. That's actually why I wrote this book. Because I didn't want to leave to go to the new library. I hated it. So I just <laughs> stayed there. And I switched from books to manuscripts. But what happens if you spend enough time in one of these things, you get instinct. And this is the most beautiful thing of doing research is when you know, this, this is like being a philologist and recreating a dead language or a language that's disappeared, is you get to the point where you say, you know what? <laughs> you know, if I go into document 103, I'm going to find it all there. I know it. And you go the next day and you get document 103. And what you imagine is there, because you spent so much time in this dead world that, you know, it's with your eyes closed. It's, it's, it's you know, it's like you're, you're walking around in the dark or you're blind. And you get a, such a sense for things that you can feel that something's there. And when you find it, your time traveling. It's absolutely amazing. But I think something that Howard was getting at, I mean, that for me is the biggest high, super high, is to do that time travel thing. But there's another thing is you get questions that interest you from the present, problems, information technology, political liberty. And you're like, I want to know where this came from. You don't go back expecting it to be the same, because it's never exactly the same. But you do try and say, what's important to us? What do we need to know now? What do I feel that I need to know about? And then you go down the rabbit hole. Um, and that might take years. Um, and, uh, and you don't know if you're going to find it. That gets pretty scary. But when you do, when you hit it, it's an amazing feeling. Um, that's why being a historian can be so cool. When I was a student, you made us read Montaigne. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Still make so it here's it. my question. Um, how do you incorporate research into your class now? Um, I know that books like that are becoming harder and harder to come across for yeah. students. I remember we had a hard time getting it. So how do you sort of bring that to life now, especially with technology and all the fun things we have in today's society? Ah, that's a really good question. I'm still assigning multi-U. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a copy if anyone needs it. <laughs> yeah, no, they come <laughs> periodically on the web. Um, uh, it's funny, you know, there was a time when people were writing history books that were both completely path-breaking and accessible to the public, or more accessible. I mean, multi-you. And you know, 35 years ago, this book that she's talking about, which is this book about a, a village of, of people uh, in, in southern France who still had an old non-Christian religion. And so they were basically heretics, and they still believed in it. And the Inquisition came after them and crushed them. Um, and the reason we know about them is because there was an inquisition and they told their story. Um, but there's another reason. A, people used to read more of those kinds of books. So they were out there. The New York Times reviewed them more. They don't review these books as much. Um, and the people who wrote these books made a great effort to write well enough. I don't, a lot of people complain about the way Montaigne is written. But you can still get something out of it. It's still really interesting. Um, I think, um, and the Stephen Greenbaugh book is another uh, example, although I was speaking at Harvard a few weeks ago, and he gave a talk, and the people who study the Renaissance kind of shredded the actual scholarship side of the book. But it's so important that someone like Greenblatt is communicating on a popular level the importance of the past. Um, what books now would I use? It's harder. People are not writing books like that anymore. Um, uh, yeah, except in American history, you see them sometimes. Right, in American I mean, history, absolutely. Shelby Foote. Right, well, yeah. Wrote three volumes with very little original new stuff in it, but it's so gorgeously written that it's probably the best intro to the American Civil War that it could be. Right. There was a time when French historians were writing books on completely unknown archives that were be New York Times bestsellers. Um, the New York Times isn't going to consider those books for review anymore. I know that because I know the editor. Um, and so the books have to be much more popular. There is now a move amongst a number of leading historians that were trying again to write books that are more accessible but still, still smart. And I'm working with a press, Basic Books, whose mission and deep belief is you can still sell smart books if you do it right. 
Um, so we're trying. But that's a huge question right now. And there have been arguments on the web if historians who try and reach out are, are betraying science. And it's just like, no, it's only if they do it badly. OK? Yeah. Yeah, good question. I have a question. <clears throat> so in your great studies and in your experience, what, what is, how would you define excellence? And how one would, how one would uh, go, go about getting excellence? <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, first of all, you can only be the judge of that. Um, uh, although your professors are going to sometimes have to be the judges of that. Um, but I'll tell you one thing, and this is this the old lesson of Pablo Picasso and how Picasso's dad taught him how to paint. Is when you think of Picasso, you think of abstract painting. That's not how he learned how to paint. His dad would take pigeon feet, cut them. He'd probably get them. I don't think he cut them off the pigeon himself. He probably got them at the market. He'd hammer them onto a board, and he'd say, draw them, and draw them again and again and again to the point where Picasso's technical capacity, Picasso, by the way, knew how to paint like a Renaissance painter, which is really, really hard to do. So technical skill first, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, is, are you a person that paints pigeon feet, or are you a genius, or are you someone who is visionary or can go beyond the pigeon feet? Obviously, Picasso being one of the great, great, great geniuses of the 20th century, took it as far as anyone except a few people in the century really did. But he started with the pigeon feet. So you've got to start with technical learning, which often hurts and is boring. That is one of the things you find that we've lost in our culture, except in classical music. How many people do something that is horrifically painful to learn their skill? Who here really has taken uh, music lessons? I was the worst student at the Longy School of Music in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that they had ever had. I had one of the most famous professors in the world and it was, it was, the, it was, everything was lost on me except the fact of excellence. I learned it there, and I learned there that I was not excellent. Yeah, and it's not just classical music. Uh, Ross on Roland Kirk always said that he, pract he practiced scales two hours a day. You know, and he was a free-form jazz horn player. So I'd say that only to reinforce what Jake just said. Good question. I, uh, I stand here in blue jeans and a, and a superhero shirt, and, uh, and I here. see you, and I see you with your amazing socks and a MacArthur Award. I, I got blue jeans. They're more like blue khakis, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> the question is, how does, how does an undergrad student like myself, uh, who's looking at, just looking at the world and thinking about where he's going to fit in it, how does he follow the path that you've, that you've tread? <laughs> Stay out of trouble. Um, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Look, man, I just said it. You've got to work really, really hard. And everyone's life is going to be totally different. And I've had a freaky, intense, amazing life that was often hard. And it's had some really good sides. And it's kind of worked out for me unbelievably, as far as I'm concerned, because I didn't necessarily have an easy, normal childhood. You know, um, I mean, again, you've got to be focused. You do have to work hard. I mean, I'm just saying, if you, I, don't, I don't know what to say, because there are plenty of happy people. I mean, in other cultures, like in Russia, you have wandering holy people. You have that in Greece. You have in a lot of traditional cultures. In Africa, you have these wandering people that carry wisdom. Americans, I think they had it more, but we don't have it anymore. So there are many paths you can take in life. It depends which one makes you happy. If you want to somehow achieve something or do something that you want to do, then you actually will probably have to sacrifice for it. That's the only thing I can tell you. You will have to do work that's really, really hard. I'll tell you something. My dad's from South Philly, really, really poor family. Um, he's a big time molecular geneticist, um, a big scientist. Uh, and what he told me uh, was that it wasn't about getting the grants. He said, no, no, you invest your own money in your research, even the money they don't give you. He said, no, 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 no. You'll give up possessions to do that. And that's an old story of people who have built stuff is you, you have to take the risk. And I remember him last year just saying, no, I, I'm not going to help you out unless I see you investing more in your own research. Um, and I was just like, yeah, oof. I was like, but dad, you know, it's, you know, it's really hard. And he was like, I don't want to hear about it. And I was just like, and that's, by the way, you know, I, there are also traditions you learn about. I learned about it from my old man who worked his way up himself from absolute poverty in South Philly. But by the way, he went to Central High in uh, Philadelphia. And back then, Central High not only had an endowment, but it was filled with people with PhDs who had done research 
who were teaching him at the high school level. They called and their diplomas degrees. The degrees, because they were degrees. How many Nobel Prizes? Central High produced an enormous number back then. Um, and so, once again, it gets back to the research university, but, and also democracy. This was a public school that would allow my dad to go as far or farther than the guys who went to the private schools and to Harvard went. And it allowed him to go into this world, and it was a very traditional world of big books, dead white guys, whatever. But some of those people had dreamed incredible dreams and written great books, but he also learned in that place was fierce discipline and competition. I hate to say it, but at the end of the day, my dad and I always laugh about people that go on vacation or take days off or retire. No way. Ain't nothing no. easy, and that's a good way for us to wrap this up. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Thank all of you.